In this two-story portal frame that we've got, we're going to apply the portal method as a way to approximate what we had guessed what the moment diagram was going to look like for these applied loads. Now, one key thing to uh, keep in mind as you apply the portal method is that we've got uh, support conditions that, in this case, are fixed. So when we say to go to the columns and assume that the inflection point for the columns for lateral loads in a moment frame are at the midpoint, well, that's true if the top and the bottom of the column are attached rigidly to something, and the, as the case would be here. If we had pinned foundations here, of course, then the inflection point would be at the, the foundation. But we got fixed, so we'll assume that the inflection point for the columns is at the midpoint. Uh, we can also make assumptions about the inflection point for the beams being also in the middle, and that's not too bad. Um, certainly consistent with the anticipated def moment diagram and the deflection shape that would go with this. Uh, some people will get fancy about these columns. If we really have a true fixed foundation, that's a lot stiffer than the uh, rigidly attached beams and columns at the top, but yet they can sway and translate and rotate. Um, and so that inflection point would actually rise a little bit. Uh, but then again, it's very difficult to have a true fixed uh, foundation, which would then make the inflection point move back down to roughly about the midpoint. So we're going to go ahead and use the um, assumption here that the uh, points inflection for the columns are at the mid-height. Right? And we will also make the assumption that the point of inflections for the beams are at mid-span. We can either make that assumption or we can make an assumption about the distribution of lateral forces to the uh, columns in terms of the column shears. And since we only have two columns, that's a fairly easy thing to do that seems somewhat obvious. It'd go half and half. Uh, but if we had multiple bays, then we want to actually use a slightly different kind of assumption. But, but here it's okay to just go ahead and use the point of inflection being at the beam location. All right, so we do this from top down. We're going to come along and make a cut right where the inflection points are. They don't have to be at mid-height. We've chosen them to be. And wherever that is at for the column, that's what we're going to want to do for our free body diagram. So let's get that started. That makes everything so much easier um, because the inflection point is where the moment is zero. And that means then that it makes it quite easy to deal with the free body diagram, right? Because now we can sum moments about one end, and we'll get what the column axial force is going to be. We have a height here of 7.5 feet. We've got a bay width that is uh, 25 feet. So, of course, if we sum moments about, let's call that C prime, then we get 10 times 7.5 minus our axial force that's in our column. Let's call it P, F, times our 25 feet equals 0, and then that will be 75 divided by 25. G could have done that in my head. And so therefore, our axial force equals 3 kips. And you're like, well, that's not what I wanted to know. I wanted to know what those shears are. Well, that's where either assuming that we have a, a uniform distribution of the shear in the simple case or knowing what where the beam inflection point is located is going to tell us what we want. And that is that if the beam inflection point is at the mid-span, that would be at 12.5 feet. We're at 7.5 feet high. We've got then the lateral load of 10. And we've got the then axial force of 3. And we have then this shear force that we're after here up in the top level. I'm going to call it V2 because it's really the second story. And of course, there is a shear and an axial force in the column. We're going to sum moments at that midpoint. Let's call that E prime. So sum of moments about E prime 
and of course we don't care about the 10, we get instead minus 3 times the 12 and a half, and then plus the 7 and a half times the V2. Is that equal to 0? I sure hope that V2 turns out to be equal to 5. Let's find out. 3 times 12.5 divided by 7.5, and sure enough that equals 5. If you were to check out all the details about where the 3 came from and substituting in from that stuff up here, you'd find out that um, this would absolutely um, give us that the shear is half with given uh, the number of columns that we've got here. And so likewise we'd find out in both cases that the <coughs> shear on the other side would be 5. Now to get the moment at the top, of course that's just going to be 5 times 7.5, that's the 37 and a half and that's going to be the same that's going to turn out to be in the as we go around the corner on the joint same thing over here we get of course negative 37 and a half for the beam 37 and a half for the top of the uh, column and then the bottom of the column will also be 37 and a half because of course we have the shear being at the mid height and so the moment arm is the same all right so now Let's go take a look at one of these joints. Right? And actually, let's make it a little bit easier. Let's go to that joint right there. So now we've got, of course, the axial forces. We've got shear forces on that joint. We've got the moment that is going to be there, which will be at that base 37.5. And we have then from the column see how would the column work well let's kind of play this all out and see what we think might be going on bottom of the column is going to have a moment like this top of the column will have a moment like that and that means that the effect of the column on the joint is that way that's two of them spinning in the same direction seems to me we better have an equilibrating moment going on so whatever this moment is in the beam has to be equal to the sum of these two column moments. That's kind of an important thing, understanding to, to have about how those joints are going to work. And I went to that joint to take a look at that. It's going to, because um, even though it's going to be the same kind of thing happening over here, we get the lateral load being imposed there on that free by diagram. And I didn't want to confuse all that. You have all, I haven't shown the, the beam and the column shears and axial forces in that particular uh, view. I didn't want to get into that quite yet. Let's instead go and do our next free body diagram. Now you could um, chop this all up at, at sort of a method of sections kind of thing and only take the middle portion. I prefer not to do that. I prefer to take the entire top half. That way I don't have to deal with any new internal moments that are going on. Just the ones I'm maybe possibly interested in you know, or any other forces that might be at work. And so I just try to simplify it, and that's what I'm really saying. Make it a little bit easier to play with. You know, I'm still going through where that inflection point is at. We'll have to keep track of all the distances here. The top force is smaller than the bottom force because of a tributary effect going on there. We are at these points that we could call B prime and A prime if you really wanted to get into all that. And so we've got the column shears, the column axial forces at work here. And so that's it, though. That's it. So notice how much simpler that looks than if we had taken sort of this little big T. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. It's this big T cutting through all those inflection points. I'd rather just kind of sit here up at the top. We've got 15 feet there and then 9 feet down to get to these two locations. There's your B prime and here's your axial force right there. And just like we did before, let's some moments about this B prime. We'll get the axial force. We get 10 times 15 plus 9 plus 20 times 9 and then minus the piece of A times the 25 foot moment arm set it equal to zero. And so let's see what we get this time. That's 26 times 10 plus 20 times 9 
and then divide by 25, and now p sub a equals 17.6 kips. So now you say, well, what do we do? Well, because this is a little bit more complicated than what we had before, there's a lot of different things you could do. Um, you could sum moments on the other end and prove that the other axial force is 17.6. Okay, that, we don't really want to want that. We kind of figure that out. We could go and do the little free body diagram like we did before, essentially sort of the little T-shape at the inflection points. That would be one way because we're trying to figure out what that shear is, is going to be. And all we would really be doing is verifying what we've already figured out, which is that those column shears are going to split evenly the panel shears. That's ultimately what happens there. So we've got 17.6 axial there. Up on the other end we got 3. We have the 5 kip shear, 20 kip load applied right there, and then we have a shear in the beam and an axial force at the beam. This is at the midpoint of that beam, and well, let's call that F prime, and so our distances vertically here are going to be seven and a half foot there. We've got, um, I'm missing a shear, I'll get that here in a second, nine foot there and twelve and a half foot over there, and we want the column shear, of course. That's what we'll call V1. And we'll just work it out longhand and prove what we were sort of anticipating would be the case. Right? So we'll sum moments about F prime. Let's take clockwise as positive. And the 20 goes away because it goes right through. That's kind of nice. We get a net of a 3 and a 17.6. So that's 14.6 going the other way at 12 and a half feet. And then we get plus 5 times the 7.5. And, and then we get the plus V1 times the 9 equals 0. And we hope that that's going to be equal to 15 kips because that would be half of the total panel shear. Let's see what happens here. 14.6 times 12.5 minus 5 times 7.5. That was a 37.5 moment. That's 145 divided by 9 equals 16.1. Okay, why didn't it work out the way I, because that's not half. So let's take a closer look, make sure I, I uh, did everything right. 17.6 minus 3 is the 14.6 times the 12 and a half, right, and that's going to be net going counterclockwise plus 5 times 7.5 equals 145 divided by 9. Then you get 16.1. I don't like that. I don't have a good answer. And I know where the problem is. Right back here. That's not 26, that's 24. So good, we fit. I was about to stop the recording and go figure out a new way to do this and show you that I could do it perfect, but hey, there you get to see live I'm not perfect. That should be 16.8. That makes that 16.8, 16.8, and that will make this then. 3.8 and let's see 3.8 times 12.5 mine oh. you got all kinds of problems here that's 13.8 13.8 times 12.5 plus 5 times the 7.5 minus now divided by 9 and whammo, we get the V1 equal to 15 kips. All right, and so that means that our shears are 15, half of the story shear, like I had said that they ought to be. And then, so 15 times 9 is 135. 
35 top and bottom because of the symmetry at work there. That's in the column. So that's 135 here. Uh, 135, 135. And so 135 plus 37.5, the beam moment is going to be 172.5. And that's our guesses for our moment diagrams and the end moments. We could also uh, go complete the rest of that for the shears and everything else.